Every year we release a video for people who are looking to buy their first camera. And every year people get really mad in the comments because I recommend different cameras than the one that they think is the best camera. Uh, I will say that there's, I, I'm reaching out to a different audience with the which camera should you buy video. I'm reaching out to people who don't have a camera. Most of you already have a camera and you're super enthusiastic about it and you're watching videos on YouTube about cameras. You represent the like 1% most enthusiastic part of photography. Even most serious photographers aren't watching YouTube videos about it. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I share it, but you are not the regular Joe and I'm trying to make a video for regular Joes. So the biggest difference between, uh, the biggest reason that I recommend is something different than you might think might be the ultimate video is that I'm trying to address a different audience. and. It's easy for me to get trapped into an echo chamber where I only talk to other super enthusiasts. So I make a point of reaching out to civilians, like people who aren't into it and talking to them about their photography experience, what cameras they own, how they used them and whether they enjoy using it or whether the camera just ended up collecting dust. Ultimately, I want people to love photography. I don't care if they love cameras. If they get the most experience and enjoyment out of using their smartphone, then that is fine by me as long as they are taking pictures. So let me throw a plug in for our training materials. We have stunning digital photography, the number one photography book in the world with more than 14 hours of video built into it. You can just watch the videos. You can join the Facebook group to get support from your peers. You can just do the hands-on practices. This is going to make your photography a lot better. It's going to make a lot bigger difference than uh, buying a new camera would. And it's only 10 bucks at stp.io slash store. We also have books on Lightroom and Photoshop, both with tons of video training, 14 hours specifically, and a whole book just on camera gear in case that's just what you're into. Uh, the first explanation that I had in this video was that I explained that most people probably shouldn't buy a camera. And that's something that I've come to believe in the last year or two. There are different factors that have gone into this. First, in the last year or two, we've seen cameras introduce portrait mode. Um, we've also seen smartphone marketing and smartphone advancements lead with improvements to the camera in it, and they really have gotten much better. And smartphone cameras are improving at a much faster pace than full grown adult interchangeable lens cameras have. And that trend will probably continue for quite some time. Cameras are simply being left behind. Cameras now are definitely take better pictures in a wide variety of scenarios. Like I explained, sports and wildlife, serious portraiture, big landscape prints, certainly real cameras still win there, but that's not the way that most people use their cameras. When I talk to most people, they just take some pictures of their kids. They want to take some pictures when they travel. And could a camera potentially produce noticeably better results in those scenarios? Yes. But when I talk to people about how they use their pictures, they put some on Facebook, they put some on Instagram, and there you probably wouldn't ever notice any difference. These are people, most people will not read the manuals for the cameras. They will not buy other lenses for their cameras. They will only use the lens that came with it. Many of them have an interchangeable lens camera, but don't realize that they could get a different lens for it. This is most people. I know it's not you, but these are the people that I'm trying to address. And I don't want to tell somebody to go buy some camera that has 14 bit of dynamic range when they're never going to go into the menu systems or take it out of full auto mode because that is most people. And it's different from the audience that I address every day. So I started out with a warning saying, just spend, instead of spending 500 bucks on a camera, put an extra 500 bucks into a better smartphone that has a better camera built into it. And I believe that's the best thing for most people because they will always have this with them. So many people stop carrying their camera, their full-size camera with them because it's a pain, because you have to charge the battery separately, because it takes up some extra room in their bag. And then they say, oh, the pictures of my smartphone look really good. Cameras are also a pain because you have to transfer the images from the camera to your phone, either via SD card or via Wi-Fi or something. Then it used to be that all of us sat at a PC all day. But nowadays, almost everybody's on mobile devices. Um, younger people don't have a PC at all, don't know how to use a PC, don't know what memory cards are, don't have any experience with them. These are becoming outdated concepts quickly because here you have one device that captures, edits, and shares everything instantly. It has some distinct advantages like a screen that's much bigger than the screen on your camera, um, the portability, the ability to do live streaming. 
Um, this thing has 4K 60 video that beats the video output at that focal length than our serious cameras. Like, they're fantastic. They're fine. And like I said, I don't care if they get a real camera. So why did I recommend the Canon T3 as the cheapest possible option? Because these things are so readily available on the used market. They are not great cameras. Uh, the autofocusing is tough. The lens is incredibly cheap and produces crappy results. And I said that this will produce worse results in your smartphone camera, and that's true. We've done side-by-side -side tests. Modern smartphone cameras produce noticeably better results. If you go into portrait mode, the background blur looks better, the colors are better, and everything is instantly shareable. So nobody should really buy this camera unless they want to get into photography as a hobby or they're taking a college class or something that requires them to use a real camera. But that's something I felt like I had to recommend. Um, the D5500 here offers a flip screen, which is really common. People like to take pictures of themselves nowadays. Selfies are a big thing, but if you're shooting video, um, it's nice to be able to hold the camera low and see it. I think the flip screen adds a lot of versatility and the D5600 adds um, a touch screen. So there are lots of cameras that I could have recommended at the $450, $500 used range. Um, the one people always get upset I didn't recommend are the Sony APS-C cameras. Like you could pick up a Sony A5100 or Sony A6000 for about this price range. Don't like those cameras, just straight up don't like them. Uh, didn't like them at the time, don't like them now. I know a lot of you love them, but the battery life on them, we found it to be appalling and frustrating. The menu system is infuriating. The APS-C lenses that are available for them are not very good. Uh, the focusing is incredibly inconsistent and unreliable. Uh, the A5100 does have a flip forward screen, but the touch screen is, is pretty appalling. Um, the, I just found the D5500 to be like an overall better camera for the average Joe. So that's why I recommended it. It's not like I hate Sony. You're going to see me recommend a whole bunch of Sony cameras later. But at that price point, I still think that's the best you could do. Uh, I recommended a lot of Fuji cameras in this video because I, I love the controls on a Fuji. And I think people who want to pursue photography as a hobby, they often romanticize the entire process. Um, what they don't want is necessarily like an 80s looking SLR. What they want is something that feels cool. And I think the X-T20 feels cool. It has analog controls for things like the shutter speed and the aperture, and that makes you feel like a real photographer. Um, the XC20 is also like just a good looking camera that you don't necessarily mind having on a strap on your shoulder if you're going out or something. It doesn't make you look like a dork, like a big SLR does. Um, so that's why I recommended it. Is it gonna produce better images than a cheaper Sony A6000? No. But I think it's an overall better experience. And when somebody gets a camera, I want them to, there are lots of different things that will keep them shooting. The biggest factor in how their photography evolves is that they keep shooting though. And I think the Fuji cameras are just better to use than the APS-C Sony camera. So the number one disconnect here is you guys are all about like dynamic range and pixels and oh, what, but it only has compressed raw versus uncompressed raw. Nobody really cares about that stuff. The average show keeps it in JPEG. They care about the experience. They they want to share awesome pictures of themselves and their families and kind of record memories, but they don't get that deep into the technical stuff. The XT20 excels at just like usability. And that's the same reason I recommend the XT2. I I just adore the XT2. I, I warned people that like the battery life sucks and that can be really frustrating, especially as you start to get serious about it. But overall, you're buying into a great system, whereas the Sony APS-C system doesn't have really any good lenses. We've tested them all. I don't like really like any of the APS-C Sony lenses. The new G Master full-frame lenses, some of them are great. But Fuji has great APS-C lenses that, that their bodies take full advantage of. You don't have to upgrade to full-frame to get great lenses in Fuji. But in the Sony world, you kind of do. And... Sony seems to be putting all their development effort into the full-frame cameras too. It's like Sony APS-C is kind of dying off and Fuji is heavily investing in the APS-C format. And I think that sensor size is fine. Uh, and the Fuji experience is just great too. 
But at the same time, I'm really torn about the D750 because the D750 is an inexpensive full frame camera that will produce cleaner images. It'll give you better background blur. You get access to Nikon's full frame lens lineup, things like the amazing 105 millimeter F14 in case people want to upgrade to that stuff in the future. You can get yourself 600 millimeter F4. Can't get that for the Fuji. Uh, for the Fuji. And when I'm recommending these cameras, I have to think about... Uh, the entire future of the photographer. Because when you buy a camera, you also buy into that lens lineup. And most people will use the same lens lineup, same cameras for a decade, 20 years. Sometimes they hand it down to their kids. So many people are Canon photographers today because their parents were a Canon photographer like 30 years ago. So the lineup that you buy into is, is really a serious choice. And it's something I put a lot of thought into. And along those lines, you'll notice I, I didn't recommend many micro four thirds cameras. The previous generation of this had things like the EM10 uh, recommended. And I, I pulled that out because I, as I've noted in other videos, I'm concerned about the longevity of the micro four thirds lens lineup. I think it's going to kind of fade away. And I don't know that I want people buying into it. I have those same concerns about the Nikon F mount, the DSLR mount here. But I do believe Nikon's going to continue to invest in that uh, for a couple of years, because I don't feel like their mirrorless bodies are there yet. There's also just a wider variety of higher end lenses, things that will produce noticeably different images than your smartphone would in the Nikon full frame mount. So that's my justification. The uh, Fujifilm X-T3 is, we haven't published our full review on it yet, but it's a marvel. It's a delight to use. The battery life still blows but it's a little bit better because of software tricks. Um, but overall, it's my favorite camera to have with me. It doesn't produce the best images. It's not going to be my A7R three or my D850, um, but it's just a great camera and it can do a little bit of everything. So that's why I push people towards it. Video two, the 4K60 on it's just gorgeous. Um, I'm stepping people up next to the A7 III and this offers a couple of things. It's a full frame sensor. But with the 24 to 105 f4 versus the f2.8 lens on the Fuji images video, they're going to look about the same. But the Sony a7 III has a stabilized sensor, which is really useful and a big step up from the X-T3. It also has dual card slots um, that will record video to both card slots, which is serious for some people. The X-T3, the D D750, X-T2, of course, they all have two, two card slots. Um, and the a7 III has this like amazing eye detect autofocus that works even better than the Fuji does. And it's just all around like a fantastic camera. It's not a joy to use like the X-T3 though. The buttons and dials and stuff just like aren't great. And the menu system's a pain in the ass, but it's a good camera and the battery life is excellent on it too. I think it's just a better all around camera. Um, and then for people who have unlimited budgets, these are the two cameras that Chelsea and I pick up, the D850 and the A7R3. And I really haven't figured out that one is better than the other. It totally depends on the lens that we want to use, depending on which one we pick up. I, I overall, I don't know, I prefer to hold the D850, but the A7R3, uh, I like the electronic viewfinder on it. So we're still too torn, but I think these are my two favorite like all around cameras. Um, when it comes to landscape photography, I kind of explained this, but Autofocus becomes not that important, um, but you do kind of want sharpness. And I told people like your smartphone is fine. And that's true for most situations if you're just putting it on social media because you don't need shallow depth of field. But if you are getting serious about it, maybe you want to make prints for your house or something. Here's where sharpness kind of comes in. Some people do editing and they want to get more dynamic range out of it because dynamic range can be huge in landscape photos if you're shooting into the sun. The D5500 has that like excellent dynamic range that the Canons lack. Um, I could have recommended a Sony here, but as I already explained, I, the Sony APS-C cameras, I couldn't find any good lenses for them, whereas the Sigma 18-35 to is an awesome lens. You can do stars and stuff with it even. Sony really doesn't have anything equivalent. If there had been like a good native 18-35 F1.8 for the Sony um, made by Sony, then I probably would have done it, but crazy adapters and stuff are available, but I just never found that to be an effective and usable way to do it. So that's why I recommend the D5500. I also really like the flip out screen for things like landscape photography. Um, the D800D is 36 megapixels, no AA filter along with this Tamron. It's just, it's cheaper for that sort of full frame megapixels than, than anything else I could find. Now, 
there's also Pentax. Um, previously, I'd recommended Pentax K1. It's an excellent camera, has some features that no other camera has. It is still going to produce fantastic images, but I have a really hard time at this point recommending the Pentax K mount because I'm concerned about the future of Pentax full frame. They announced the K1 and they kind of did nothing. They haven't really, haven't really seen anything new from them. They announced the K1 Mark II, which was essentially the same camera. You could even send your K1 in to get it upgraded. Like they didn't change the sensor or anything. There's no like great new lenses coming out. So I had to like look inside myself to see, could I recommend Pentax now? with the fear that people would buy into Pentax and then never see any new full frame lenses from it, I felt more comfortable pointing people towards an icon where they had a wider variety of less expensive used lenses. The Pentax is cheaper and has more features, but Nikon, all the lenses, I just felt like I needed to pull the Pentax out of the recommendations and focus on Nikon cameras. I don't like the Sony a7R II. Uh, did a lot of landscape photography with it, just hated the battery and the unreliable focusing. Nonetheless, for landscape photography, it produces stellar images with beautiful dynamic range, and the video is great out of it too. Um, but what's really pushing me to recommend it is how far advanced the Sigma 16 to 35 f2.8 is. It, it blows away the comparable Canon, Nikon, Sigma, Tamron lenses. We tested them. It's so vastly sharper. It also has a front element small enough that you can put filters on the front of it instead of using like drop-in filters and it's lighter and easier to carry. That lens itself is why I pushed people towards the Sony body. It's It produces much better images than you can get out of Nikon and Canon, I promise. And the Sony a7R III is a big step up from the a7R II. Battery life probably being the biggest thing. Which camera should you buy for sports? This is a tough one. The number one thing people buy a camera for is they try to take pictures of their kids' sports games with their smartphone, and it sucks because, you know, it's got a wide-angle lens on it. You can't get that close. It doesn't focus quickly, and it, there's always, like, a little beat. So I try to put them into a real camera for this. It's, it's like, one of the reasons people should buy it. This is just cheap, and the 18-135 to is good and versatile. Um, you know, if they're shooting basketball or volleyball, they can be at the wide end and still get shots if it's soccer or something where you're shooting further away. 135 with the 1.6 crop is pretty, pretty close to 200, which is where most sports photographers are probably shooting anyway. But the original 7D, which I shot with for years, still an awesome camera and like $260 used on Amazon right now. Like you can go to that link and buy one. And that's like remarkable. It's fantastic sports camera. The Tamron lenses aren't great. I recommended it over and over again because we shot with it for years. They're, they're sharp, but they're built terribly and they're not especially well weather sealed and they focus breathe like crazy, but they're super cheap and they're good enough. Most people are happy with them. 70 Mark II better. Um, the D 500 is amazing. The focusing points just going to the edge of the frame. Um, it, the biggest difference between this and the 70 Mark II is the D 500 doesn't have an AA filter on it. And we found it produced noticeably sharper lenses because of that noticeably sharper images. The 70 and 70 Mark II have pretty heavy AA filters, which just, crush the sharpness. So you get more out of the same lens with the D500. Um, and the X-T3 is, offers no viewfinder blackout, which was a huge benefit. Uh, if you were to use the X-T3 with no viewfinder blackout and then switch back to a DSLR, it'd feel like you were using an antique because DSLRs are like clank, 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 and they the whole view goes black. But this is just like watching a continuous video feed. It makes the whole experience more enjoyable and also makes it easier to track action. If you're an existing DSLR shooter, uh, you've gotten used to it. Like you get used to those things. So you're not like, oh man, I can't believe the clinking because you just, that's what you know. But once you use this, it's really much better. And so if somebody's buying a new camera and they want to shoot sports with it. Yeah, I'm going to put them into that. Along the same lines, lines that A9 has the same benefit, um, along with faster focusing um, and better eye detect autofocus and 20 frames per second, like real, realized 20 frames per second. The X-T3 um, technically does 30 frames per second, but it doesn't do that when it's tracking moving subjects. We found and it dropped to about 11, 12 frames per second with moving subjects and got about eight frames per second in focus, whereas the A9 is really truly capable of getting 20 frames per second tracking a moving subject in focus. And I also think for sports shooters, Sony's probably going to do a better job of building that out. The 400 F2.8 they already have is amazing. We're probably going to see other telephoto lenses coming soon. 
Here, I previously had a Nikon D5, which before the A9 existed was kind of my favorite. Um, and it's still amazing. But the A9 is such a big leap over DSLRs with the higher frame rate and um, the no viewfinder blackout. Now that Sony is putting out telephoto lenses like the 400 f2.8, I feel kind of comfortable. People who would be watching this video, I, I couldn't think of anybody I'd want to push a D5 to. If you look at the sidelines on a football game, you're still going to see mostly Canons, some Nikons, and basically zero Sonys. But that doesn't mean that's what everybody should be doing. These photographers have probably been at it for decades. They already own gear. They're not likely to switch if something's not broken. Many of them work for ESPN or something who assigns them gear so they don't necessarily choose. It's going to take a long time before mirrorless cameras move into the sidelines. Um, probably not even the next Olympics, maybe the one after that. But that doesn't mean for people watching this video that they should be picking up an old style DSLR for them. Um, portraits, another big reason that people buy a first camera. The number one thing they want is like more background blur and that stuff because portrait mode on smartphones nowadays is pretty damn good. I, I explained that I wouldn't recommend smartphones to professionals because doesn't you don't look professional. People aren't going to take you seriously. But also the like fake background blur doesn't look perfect. It's going to be flawed and I wouldn't want to be making a big print out of something like that. But nowadays, most portraiture is just slapped up on Instagram for, a, you know, and forgotten in 15 minutes. But for people who are doing serious stuff, they kind of do need a camera. And the D5300, I like the Nikon world better here because the sensors just have deeper dynamic range than the Canons do. And that comes up in portraits. If you're doing video editing or, or photo editing, you'll see the difference. Nikon has great lenses. The Canon lenses are a little cheaper, but this one going for 160 U's is a great first lens for portrait photographers. And then I try to get people into full frame as fast as possible because the full frame the best portrait lenses are pretty much all full frame. There's not really any good APS-C portrait lenses that reliably autofocus. And I'm, I'm talking about the Sigma 50 to 100 f1.8 there. Could be good, except we just found the autofocus to be unreliable, so I can't recommend it. But the D610, D610 um, not a great camera, one card slot, but it's so cheap used right now that you can get that end of lens for 1300 bucks, and that seems crazy to me. But then whenever possible, I want to put people into a camera with two card slots so they don't lose the entire shoot or wedding or something. And the D750 is just a workhorse. It's been around for years now. It's old, but it's still getting the job done. And I have so many pros who shoot with it every day and have hundreds of thousands of shots on it. And it just keeps doing the job. Same thing with the Tamron zooms. Um, at the same time, the benefits of, of mirrorless the Sony a7 III and a7R III with their eye detect autofocus is, is pretty huge. And I'm not basing this only on my own firsthand experience, but I talked to a lot of wedding photographers and those that have switched to Sony and the a7 III specifically are happy with it. They're glad that they switched. So it's not just speculation or lab tests or something. This is me talking to people who are doing this every day and the Sonys are working out for them. Uh, I'm glad for that too. Um, it's time we saw an advancement in the tech. The A7R three most portrait photographers will never need more than 24 megapixels. In fact, it'll slow down their workflow some, but for people who did want to produce those better images, it's better. Um, and then wildlife, it's one of my favorite styles. And I, again, the Canon, Canon really used to own this world with the 7D series, which was high frame rates, like the one series focusing system. Um, and Canon offered this 400 millimeter F56 prime, which is unstabilized, um, but it's super sharp and it's really lightweight, which means a lot when you're holding a lens like this and tracking moving birds and it's super cheap used right now. So to get the whole setup here for under a thousand bucks, is pretty amazing. Cause this was like, we were selling images with this setup a few years back. That's a great deal. 70 Mark II, again, just better. As with sports, the D500 takes off the AA filter and makes everything noticeably sharper. Even though we're trading a prime lens for a zoom lens, we tested them side by side. This combination significantly sharper and adds the benefits of image stabilization and zoom. Zoom really helps out beginning photographers. And then the 500 F5.6 F5, Prime, I just tested it recently. It's noticeably sharper than the zoom. It's noticeably heavier too. Um, but at the same time, it's still pretty compact and pretty cheap for 500 millimeters. And then like the big daddy, everybody shoots with the 600 F4 basically. And then some variant of teleconverter like 
all the dentist wildlife photographers that I know who, you know, they have a portion, they don't care about $16,000, not a big deal. I'm like, this is what they get. Um, it's unbeatable. Canon doesn't have anything like it, unfortunately. And Sony doesn't make 600 millimeter lenses. So neither does Fuji. So you're just in this world. And I know people are going to bring up like, what about the EM1 and the uh, Olympus 300 millimeter F4? Uh, I did test it. We have it. I've shot it side by side. The images are noticeably worse. Uh, Olympus doesn't make a high resolution body, not something you could shoot action with. Um, so they're limited at like 20 megapixels as opposed to 45. And detail is so important with wildlife where you almost end up cropping every time. Um, also, the autofocus system on the Olympus cameras isn't up for, isn't nearly as accurate with tracking birds. It does okay. It works. But this is like vastly better. It's also vastly more expensive, but, and then vlogging. Um, I know people are going to be infuriated by this because everybody hates the Canon lineup because they don't give you 4k and I'm upset by that too. Like we're a 4k channel. Um, but in the last year or so, I've really appreciated how important it is to have a camera that will just focus on my face. And that sounds really simple, but it's really hard. The only cameras that do it reliably now are the Canon and uh, the Sony, the newest generation of Sony cameras, not the older Sony's, just those. That's it. The Nikons don't do it reliably. Um, uh, Fuji does it okay, but there's no recent Fuji that has a flip forward screen and you got to be able to see yourself. I know you could add a field monitor or something, but as soon as you add a field monitor, you have an extra cable, you have an extra battery that you have to charge, you have an extra adapter, your gear is suddenly much heavier and clunkier. It really needs to all be built in to be a practical vlogging camera. And I meant when I said like a gimbal and a smartphone is going to be fine for most, it's just fine. Like people are vlogging, they're not making videos that are going to last five years. It's something temporary. The workflow is more important than anything else. 1080 is generally fine too. So that's why I would recommend the M50. It's compact. The lenses are crap, but you're not going to get any great background blur out of it, but it focuses on you and that's better than not being in focus. The RX100 Mark VI is the Sony it has a good Sony autofocus. It'll find your face, but it doesn't have a fast lens. It's not going to blur the background again, but you can at least zoom in. And that's something you can't do with your smartphone. So if you need to get B-roll at 200 millimeters, you can do that and you can flip the screen forward. But it's, you're, you're going to be using the on-camera mic probably. Um, the flip up screen just isn't great. It doesn't have a hot shoe to put a mic on it. So you can get all sorts of attachments and adapters and stuff. But again, that's the kind of thing you want to adapt. So I kind of assume... If you're using this, you're holding it at arm's length, or maybe you have a selfie stick or a gimbal or something, but you're probably not wiring in, in external sound. Video looks great, but is it substantially better than my smartphone at 24 millimeters? No. The EOS R is a full frame version of the Canon, and it does a great job of locking in my face. And I can put on fast full frame primes, like our favorite, the 24 millimeter F14, and it looks great. It sucks. It has one card slot. I've already lost video from it. I'll probably lose video again. Um, but it keeps me in focus when I have to film myself and that's not something anything else does. So what am I supposed to use? It's got a flip forward screen. <laughs> I would love to use a Sony or something, but I, I can't. So I wish I had 4K, it doesn't. What am I gonna do? Uh, which camera should you buy for video? I mean, it has 4K, but it has this crazy crop on it. What I will do is I'll put this Canon 16 to 35 F4 it's stabilized. I'll zoom it back to 16. And then I can actually use it for vlogging in 4K. But honestly, nobody really cares if they see my face in 1080 or 4K anyway. So like I just stick with 1080. If you're behind the camera here, I still think the micro four thirds cameras are a value because Panasonic really pushed 4K tech before any other company did. It's not something particular about the smaller sensor that makes that possible. Just Panasonic got to it first. They just had that tech. So you can get these like small and inexpensive cameras that have 4K and flippy screens. And that's why I recommended a whole series of Panasonic cameras. They've what, they're what we've used for years. Um, the Fuji X-T3 is absolutely stunning. You can't see yourself, so it's not going to be a great vlogging camera. But if you're standing behind it, it's fantastic. Still only records video to one card slot though, still has a recording time limit. Those things are a pain in the butt. So it's hard to recommend people use it for serious stuff when a card could fail and then you've lost the whole shoot. So for that reason, I have to push people towards like a GH5, which will record video to two card slots. Micro Four Thirds, the lenses are still kind of a weakness and pretty much, I've heard that 
everybody who shoots with the GH5 eventually migrates towards a speed booster and the Sigma 18 to 35. And myself and several other photography bloggers have all ended up with this setup organically, like independent from each other. We show up at an event and we're like, oh, I see you figured that out too, right? Um, through experimentation, through trying everything, adapting this lens with a speed booster seems to be better than using a native lens. So that's why I recommend that. And then the Sony a7 III, like it's a marvel. It's way better than the Sony a7S II. For example, it has a touchscreen, um, has a stabilized sensor, and the autofocus is fantastic. And really, it's going to be like a better overall video camera. I know a lot of wedding videographers who are just using this now. They just buy three of them. They'll just set them up all around. They reliably autofocus on stuff. The battery lasts a pretty long time. They're just good, versatile, do-it-all style video cameras. Anyway, that wraps it up. One less plug for the store if you actually want to learn photography. We have Photoshop, Lightroom, buying guide and stuff. Um, now you can go down in the comments and complain how stupid I am because I didn't recommend your camera because, of course, you picked the best camera. I'm actually totally open to hearing uh, why you think um, my target audience for this video should have bought something different. I'm interested in having a discussion around that. And I will look at your feedback and I will wrap it up into the next version of this because I do arrive at this based on talking to a lot of people and hearing a lot of real world experiences. I don't want it to just be what are Tony's favorite cameras. I want it to be what cameras will people use and love that will get them into photography for decades. So politely tell me your thoughts down below. Thank you.